The first initiation ritual of the Elemental Lodges of Atlantean Democracy is hosted in the Lodge representing the element of Earth. As we approach the Lodge of Earth, we see its bricks are yellow and its mortar is pink, and that on its roof is the symbol of its element as one of the platonic solids. Earth is equal to a cube. The cube of Earth is pink, or more accurately, indigo, because this is the position it holds on the rainbow spectrum of seven colors that constitutes the foundation of much of Atlantean social structure. As we enter the Lodge of Earth to begin this ceremony, let us pause on the name of the ritual for this degree, and its meaning to us as students of Atlantean society. The student of Atlantis is not yet awakened to their full psychic potential. They suspect there may be more to the meanings they apprehend, but they are not as sure of their faith in this as they are in the limited spectrum they know for certain through their five physical senses. They see the ideal of curiosity, but are fallen from their innocent belief in the unlimited ultimate goodness of reality. Therefore, whenever a student of ESP decides to cease being such, and to begin to enter into the folds of purely mental contemplation, they enter the Earth Lodge of Atlantis first, and the ritual they seek there is that which transforms them to a full Atlantean citizen with the right to vote in its psychic elections. To exercise our rights as Atlantean citizens, we begin to impose our own wills on society in a ratio to our belief in our own control of such. Thus, once one completes the first degree initiation ritual, they belong to the Contributors Club of the Order of Death. The name of the ritual performed in the Earth Lodge for initiation into the Contributors Club is called the Three Kings Rite or the dream of the three kings, drama. By studying this rite, we can imagine ourselves undergoing it, and this method is, itself, all that is required by it to be initiated into it. Let us enter the vault, where I will briefly describe the events of the drama. More may be found regarding this ritual in the written version of the One Degree Contributors Club literature. The premise of the drama is that it is a dream shared by the three kings, Cheops, Chephren, and Menkara, the three generations of pharaohs who commissioned the building of the great pyramids of Giza, Egypt. The dream begins with Cheops passing over into the realms of the dead, where he awakens studying the tree of life of Kabbalah. Suddenly he is awakened from his reverent studies by the first guide. The guide explains that Cheops is outside the New Jerusalem, the capital city of heaven. The god who lives in this city is summoning Cheops to attend to a meeting in the temple at the heart of the city. The bell is tolling, and he must hurry. When the initiate reaches the gate of the city walls, the first guide is exchanged for a second guide, and this is explained to the candidate to represent the passage of the person of the dreamer from Cheops to his son, Chephren. The second guide leads the candidate through the winding alleys of the city of God, while the sound of the bell tolling draws closer, until finally they reach the outer courtyard of the temple in the middle of the city. There, the second guide is exchanged for a third, who hails the candidate as Menkare, son of Chephren, and explains to them that they arrived just in time and shuts the gates after them. The candidate stands inside a representation of a courtyard inside the walls of the temple. Surrounded by hooded and masked actors wearing either blue or red, who are all milling in a large crowd around the center of the temple courtyard where there is a green tetrahedronal building. Just then, a darkness comes over the courtyard, and a figure wearing white appears under ultraviolet lighting from the green tetrahedronal temple. He addresses himself as the Metatron, and explains the reason for the spirits being called to the meeting. The Metatron explains a certain number of the assembled crowd are being summoned to reincarnate to planet Earth in order to fill the bodies of workers to build the Great Pyramids. He says, those who wish to pursue this task will be rewarded 
according to their rank while in life, by additional privileges as souls after death in the form of roles in a more heavenly form of government, called democracy. He says, finally, those who wish to proceed in this task must first choose whether they want to participate in democracy or if they wish to continue as angels, only worshiping God, but without free will to control outcomes. The blue-robed actors then side with the roles of angels, while the red-garbed actors separate into the group wishing to side with democracy. Before the candidate chooses a side, the lights come on, the guide reappears behind them, and the ritual act representing the dream of the three Egyptian kings is over. The guide explains the candidate is now eligible to vote, as well as to continue with their initiation with the second ritual, the first of three that will allow them to enter office in either a psychic state or church. This concludes the first ritual. Celebration of the Death Dream by Three Kings Introduction Before the ceremony begins, a short instruction session occurs between the candidate and the initiator. The initiator, or guide, instructs the candidate on the history and characters of the ritual and gives a brief prelude and synopsis of the rite, thus, Guide The names of the three kings are Cheops, Kephren, and Menkare, who commissioned the pyramids at Giza, Egypt, as immense personal tombs. According to exoteric schoolbook history, the story told within the order of death, however, is much more detailed. According to this source, the three high kings commissioned their megalithic tombs following a shared prophetic dream. That dream is here reenacted to honor the funding contributors behind the first monumental building project since the flood destroyed Atlantis. In the ritual, the parts of the three guides will be portrayed by a single initiator. The first guide is Cheops, who passes by John the Apostle on entering the City of Heaven. The second guide is Kephren, who passes by the Archangel Anael at the entrance to the courtyard of the Holy Temple. The third guide is Menkari, who passes by Metatron, God's highest angel, to go on from this ritual into either a pseudo-political state of lodge work, a quasi-religious church of parties within the state, or to remain at this zero degree. Instruction The candidate is then asked if they understand what is going to happen among the characters during the ceremony. Thus, duly prepared, the candidate is allowed to enter the shadowy recesses of the vault room. Unseen hands help the candidate to lie flat down, face up, on the floor in the middle of the pitch black vault. When the guide's voice is heard first, a spotlight above the candidate clicks on, shining down on them, and a bell tolls faintly from the direction of the candidate's head. Voice over. Guide 1 teaching a class. This is the wedding of love and the will, because it is written in the book of the law that love is the law, love under will. Look into the book of life, and there you will see that the one love rules us all. The book of love also describes this one law, or law of one. 
it is considered a universal truth. Instruction A spotlight strikes a replica of the Kabbalist's Tree of Life shape. The faint bell tolls a second time now. Voice over, guide one. From this are suspended the seven hermetic axioms of the Kabbalion by a withering stem from the tree of life whose three trunks can join the roots of Shekinah and Malkuth below and the two branches of the eighth and the ninth above. This truth is Jakaida over Chia, Nam Tar over Nam, Father over Son, and just so, love under will. Instruction The spotlight on the Tree of Life and the one on the candidate both switch off simultaneously, leaving the room once more enshrouded by pitch darkness. At the same time, the bell tolls a third time. At the same time, the guide lifts the candidate abruptly up to their feet. Then, all of a sudden, all lights in the room click on at once, to reveal the candidate is standing at the top of a vast hill, looking out over a lush valley. In the valley we see the Tree of Life shape. Behind the candidate is a large wall between turreted towers to guard a city behind it. Guide 1 Welcome, Aki. Arise and be welcome to life after death, for you have now entered Jamrock, the Jamdom of Jagad. Hear now the sound of the death toll. The church bell chimes for thee, O recently deceased. My name is Cheops. I will guide you now. Come with me to the ways leading out of this world, reality, universe, place, and time. Follow me. Instruction The guide takes the candidate arm in arm and turns them about to face the turreted walls fortifying the city within. As the two climb up the hill toward the towering, fortified walls, voices echo from within the city, behind its massive, impenetrable facade. The guide speaks over top of these voices. Voiceovers. Come away from your reveries. You are being called by dull care. Recalled to life. It is time now. Come away from your meditations. You are called to study at the foot of God. Duty calls. Karma yoga. The work of union. The great work calls. Guide 1, overlapping the voiceovers. You must come again to the here and now, Aki. Return from the dream of the unconscious multiverse. It is only one moment before Bereshith, the beginning. We must hurry. The clock already chimes the zero hour. Instruction. The distant bell, now a little louder, chimes for a fourth time. Guide 1 Hear it tolling, follow the sound through the clear light uphill. Ascend the ancient pathway of history, concealing the underground current of energy beneath. Climb to the top of the hill, and pass the well of souls, font of consciousness, Instruction. The guide leads the candidate by a well topped with a fountain. They draw near a large gate in one wall between two turreted towers. They step up seven rainbow-colored stairs to the gate. Guide 1. You approach now the grand archway, an entrance to the city of heaven. One of the twelve gates around 
New Jerusalem, the city of God. You approach from Eden, city of the dead, northeast of New Jerusalem. You approach the gate of Naphtali that is called Benjamin from within. This is the east-northeast gate, and it is guarded by the Apostle John. Instruction. The guide has thus far walked the candidate arm in arm. Now the guide steps down and stands one stair behind the candidate. Around the corner steps the actor portraying the part of John the Apostle. Guide 1 to John. Dear John, I am Cheops, a king called to fellowship and labor amongst other kings. Let me in now, O oh dear John, the Apostle of Christ, son of our Father, by this east-northeast gate of Naphtali, entering New Jerusalem. The bell has tolled four times already, and now it will toll a fifth to candidate. Go now, I, Cheops, can follow you no longer. Instruction. The bell, now louder through the gateway, chimes a fifth time. At that same moment, John the Apostle grips the candidate's hands, their left crossing under to the candidate's right hand, their right crossing over to the candidate's left. In this strong grip, the Apostle lifts and twirls the candidate across the threshold. This grip is called the Grip of John the Apostle of Christ and called Nibiru. Guide 2, the same actor as Guide 1. Behold, Aki, I am your guide inside the New Jerusalem. My name is Kephren. Follow me now. Instruction. The guide resumes walking arm in arm with the candidate. They wind their way through seemingly endless, labyrinthine city streets. Guide 2 You have entered the city of God, New Jerusalem, by the east-northeast gate of Naphtali, called now Benjamin, by the admittance of John, Apostle of Christ, the Prince of Heaven. You are approaching the church with seven sides now. We must hurry for already the bell tolls a sixth time. Instruction. The bell, exceedingly loud now, tolls from just inside the church. Before the closed door to the outer courtyard of the temple stands a guard. Guide two to guard. Quickly, Ishkur the Anunnaki, Gnostic Archon Astaphios, in the name of Tubal Cain, I command you, Archangel Aniel, let me in. I am Kephren, the Prince King of King Cheops. I am sent to fellowship and labor on his behalf among other kings. Let me in now, Aniel. Hurry, for already the bell has chimed six times, and soon it will toll Sabbath hour in heaven and I will have arrived too late for the apocalypse. Let me in now. Let me enter the door of Sardis to the seven-sided church. Instruction. The actor portraying Aniel then opens the door of Sardis. The light from inside is even brighter than the light of New Jerusalem. Guide 2. This is the light that shines from inside Zion, in the Ark, inside the Holy of Holies, within the inner temple, beyond the outer courtyard. You now stand before an entry onto the outer courtyard of the third spiritual temple, called the Seven-Sided Church, inside the heart of New Jerusalem, the city of God in heaven. I, Kephren, cannot go on. 
You must go through the doorway alone. Instruction The candidate is ushered through the doorway. Inside the courtyard's seven walls, at the center, arises a dodecahedral stained glass dome. This is the inner temple containing Zion, whose light refracts prismatically through the stained glass dodecahedron. A very large crowd of angels of pure light and spirits appearing like people has amassed in the courtyard around the inner temple. Guide 3, played by the same actor as Guides 1 and 2, the original initiator, comes forward and presents the candidate with a robe colored white. Just then the bell tolls for the seventh time. Guide 3 My name is Menkari. I was sent to you by my father Kefren and by his father, Cheops. I have come to guide you within the outer courtyard of the New Jerusalem Third Temple. Follow me now, please. Instruction Guide 3 takes the candidate arm in arm as before and together they move up to the front of the crowd before the eastern veil of the five-sided inner temple. Just then, the veil parts and out steps the archangel Metatron. He is glowing a purple, ultraviolet hue and wears a black robe. He is very young in appearance. Metatron I speak the truth to all of you assembled here now. I bring the true word of God, King over the living and the dead. There has been a rebellion in heaven. I come to bring news. O oh, Zion, hear me, O oh, Zion. I have seen the fallen ones lowered, and I have heard their eternal lament. It began when Raziel, also called Raguel, the archangel sent to tempt Eve in paradise by the apple and Adam after the exile by giving him Kabbalah to cease his prayer for forgiveness from God. Called together the other twenty-two angels and hosts who guard the twelve gates of New Jerusalem, the seven-sided courtyard, and the four others, like Raziel, who keep watch around the inner temple. He called them by night in heaven as God had only just then descended to walk in the Garden of Paradise. Then, at the same time as God returned to heaven to exile man and to curse the serpent, Shemiaza, the name Azza, Uza, or Raziel, as Samuel the Blind, the fallen Yaldabaoth, child of Sophia, firstborn in heaven, Raziel descended with his treacherous confederate conspirators. Of the twenty-two, only six joined him. Now come closer, O lambs of Jah, and divine children. Hear me tell you about how our Lord God did send down Christ, the Son of all mankind, to descend to earth and there to catch and punish the fallen light bearer, now become an adversary to all God's good. Through the realm of the seven heavens Christ descended. Through the Ophanim permutations of Baal Shem he descended. Christ conquered all the rebel angels turned to demonic villainy who fought amongst and against their archangelic and loyal brethren of splendor and victory in one fell swoop. Then Christ lowered himself further still, past the twelve mobile aeons, and past the seven spheres, and clutched a hold of Samuel, the torturous serpent, on earth below. With Satan in hand, 
Christ descended into the very shards of the Cliffoth themselves to rule over the wasteland of Tohu and Bohu was the devil sent by Christ, and to the realms of Sheol and Jehenna were all of his minions dispatched. Oh, the fallen Grigori have I beheld with my own eyes, and on their behalf did I myself pray for amnesty. Christ told of how Sabaoth, the soul of Sacklus, the spirit of Yaldabaoth, did repent. God then promised Satan that once every millennium upon earth the devil shall be released from hell to tempt himself and all the saved into betraying their repentance. That time on earth is now. Those who arrived by the six bells chime are hereby called to labor. Four lodges that practice the three degrees of Imhotep you shall convene, and a fifth open to the public. In your four lodges you shall appoint five officers to stations, and there will be three open seats in the public lodge. These five stations will be equivalent to five political parties. The combination of all five lodges 23 total members is to be called the Atlantean Senate. Those who arrived after the seventh toll are hereby called to fellowship. First, we must convene the five political parties equivalent to the five officers' stations in each lodge. These can initiate independently of the lodges and combined to form churches equivalent to lodges and monasteries equivalent to the Senate. From candidates and monasteries elected by the churches, the Senate will appoint a Pope. The Pope can then convene a standing court. Instruction The crowd begin to divide themselves into two groups. The one forming in the north all don blue vestments, those in the south, red. Guide 3 Because you have arrived just as the bell tolled seven, you may choose either group to go with. Those angels in blue shall stay here in the outer courtyard to minister in the seven-sided church. Those spirits in red shall enter the inner temple to work the lodges and convene the Senate in heaven on earth. All of us will work together, with no secrets left unshared by any that relate to the work of us all. Instruction This concludes the ritual of the dream. The eye of the vault door is then opened and the candidate is escorted out. In the antechamber of the vault, the initiator explains the ceremony again to the initiate and asks them if they fully understand. Guide So you see that the lodges practice three degrees of initiation corresponding to Eden, New Jerusalem, and the outer courtyard of the third temple, and that these rituals date back to the three ranks of stone masons of the great pyramids commissioned by the three kings Cheops, Kephrin, and Menkare. In the three rituals corresponding to these three degrees, a candidate learns the secrets of the priestcraft allegorically, following the punishments of Raziel's co-conspirators as the killers of Hiram, grand architect on the first temple of God on earth. Likewise, the five continents each has its own form of religion. Egypto-Sumerian, Mesoamerican, Indo-Asian, Middle Eastern European, and Indigenous Aboriginal, and these all teach the way to perfect the soul through a Masonic art. The secrets of each way are taught through the rituals of the other. The Apocalypse is now when Satan tempts mankind away from these matters to pursue a merely 
venally satisfying existence. Therefore, do not be like a drone. Yours is now the one law of do what thou wilt. You may choose either path to pursue, or neither. You may choose to teach all this to others, or to only pursue it silently. You may even choose to ignore all these affairs, and live according to carnal needs alone. For because of that dream, the three great pyramids were built as a testimony for us all before eternity. Thus all that is may enter heaven, for heaven is forgiving of all sin beyond even the limits of our imaginations. All enters heaven eventually by nature alone, but we may choose the goals that give cause to our existence. Now this choice is before you. Do you understand the roles of the two options involved? Do you wish to side with either, or neither, or both? If you do not understand, now all answers can be given to you. Ask anything, or choose, now. The choice is before you. The first title is Fellowship. Fellowship requires communication between at least two entities. The entities do not need to be sentient for this kind of communication to occur. It occurs between a mother and infant, a master and pet, between a teacher and student, and even between plants snowflakes, and music. However, there exists a more complex form of communication than mere fellowship, and this occurs between only sentient beings. This superior kind of communication is called karma, and this means to be called to labor. We say that to improve one's karma is to improve one's soul, because we must work to communicate as sentient entities, and our doing so proves our worth to our fellow peers and the value of our contribution to history. Thus, a good soul is one that accumulates good karma. That is why good and bad units of karma comprise each element of our surrounding environment, our aura, because the work of the soul is yoga, union, of the within and the without. This is accomplished when the interior of the soul and its exterior aura align. Then we say its karma is finished, and the aura is cleansed. Therefore, one can only cleanse the aura of bad karma by first being called to labor from the reverie of silent fellowship. The second title is Ashlar. After the workers were called from fellowship to labor by the three kings, they began to hew stones from the quarry. What is this like? The stones began to be chiseled from the mines, but they were still uncarved, unrefined, unfinished. The rough ashlar has been compared to the uncrafted and unworked soul, while the finished ashlar, the perfect cube stone, is like the soul that transcends by finishing their karma. But the cube stone is only a symbol of the soul, while the true image of the soul's appearance is a torus, the exterior sphere of which is the aura, and whose interior spiral is kundalini ascending the chakras. 
So how do we perfect the ashlar? And how do we finish with karma? The workers democratically elected their finest carvers from amongst those in the quarries. These they called the builders, who had graduated from labor. The builders perfected the rough, unhewn souls quarried out of raw karma. From the twisted and the torturous serpent's union, the ripples and the rays combined. The chakras align and the aura is cleansed. That is how the Builders Guild perfects the Ashlar souls. From among the Builders they elected their best. His name was Imhotep. Imhotep selected his son, Tahotep, as chief overseer. The remaining Builders and workers in the quarry then elected Nyarlahotep as their representative to go on their behalf before Tahotep. The names of the three kings to call the workers out of fellowship into labor were Cheops, Chephren, and Menkare. The third title is Isaiah. Isaiah is the lowest of the four worlds in Hakabalah. The four worlds are Yetzira, between Isaiah and Bariah, and Bariah, between Yetzira and Atzaluth, the highest of the four worlds. Isaiah is the world of action and all activity both naturally occurring acts as well as the karma between sentient entities. Asaya is the combination of the mind and the physical environment by the exertion of effort by the physical tool of the body. This actually stirs up energy dystrophically, increasing entropic decay into chaos and disorder. However, what is chaos and expansion of energy in Isaiah is peace and calm order by the time it reaches Atsaluth. It has been passed by then through the inversion of Bariah and Yetzira at the hands of the builders and the aura cleansed by alignment into yoga of the karma rising up the chakras. Thus, what begins as work in the world of action becomes the domicile in which we will one day universally sabbat and finally rest from toils. The fourth title is Making. The reason we must work to cleanse our aura and to align our chakras is that they attract and spread negative karma while unaligned. This negative karma becomes manifest in our auras and thus becomes sin by narrowing our choices for actions. When we follow a tunnel reality of negative karma through perpetual sin to its logical conclusion, we find that such a tortured soul will suffer many more lifetimes in Isaiah, the lowest world. Therefore, in order to avoid such a destiny, and to instead transcend Asaya, we must use our work to make our karma good, in order for our chakras to align and our aura to be cleansed. The act of making our naturally more or less negative karmic auras into perfected more or less good karmic auras is considered the great work of those called to labor. The quarriers and the builders both work and craft the ashlar to make it from bare rock into a cube stone. So the karma yoga of cleansing the aura 
and aligning the chakras is the act of taking the given karma and making it your own work. When we take our natural karma and make it perfect by aligning our chakras and cleansing our auras, we become more capable of transcending from the world of action, Asaya, the lowest of the four worlds. Then our work will become easier and easier until eventually, in Atsaluth, we rest from toil. The fifth title is Earth. Earth, in this case, does not refer to the planet Earth so much as to the material substance of the world of Asaya. Asaya is the manifest universe of matter alone. Although the communication between mind and energy occurs via the world of matter, it is only when one applies their natural energy toward making their karma good that rest and order in Atsaluth may be accomplished and achieved. Thus, only sentient entities called to labor and who do good work, aligning their chakras and cleansing their auras, can transcend the material reality of Asaya. According to legend, the world of matter, comprised of units of karma, called quanta, arose from an event during the creation of Asaya, that is, the material universe, known as the breaking of the vessels. According to this version of the Big Bang of the universe, during the single Planck time, following the initiation of expansion by one Planck length greater than the initial singularity, all that existed were perfect geometric patterns of cycling harmonic vibrations. Following this, heat began to arise from friction as the wavelengths of these emanations began to overlap, and with that, these perfect forms became distorted and deformed into the present relative chaos and decreasing formation of patterns. Thus, according to legend, the shards of these shells form the cliffotic material world of Asaya, the smallest units of karma being the probabilistically uncertain quanta. Because the quanta of some elements of matter form solid nuclei at the center of atoms, we call this force that binds quantum nuclei together the strong nuclear force and compare it to the solid material nature of the world of Asaya and to the ancient element of Earth. The sixth title is Three. Because the material world has only six right-angled cardinal directions, we say that our universe of Asaya has only three dimensional axes. The ancients referred to these three dimensions as the three mothers, known from the Hebrew Aleph Beth as the letters Aleph, A, Mem, M, and Shin, S. These were also the three pillars of mercy, severity, and judgment, above which are suspended a pan of merit containing water and a pan of liability containing fire from a scale, a breath of air, deciding between them. The three dimensions are also symbolized in the thesis, antithesis, synthesis of dialectics, and thus by yin-yang, representing the alternation between action and passivity over time. 
So we see the concept of the three dimensions is a common expression used to communicate the idea of the world of work itself. However, three is also used to symbolize the way out of the materially real world of Asaya through good karma. Just as three represents the synthesis of Bina and Chakma in Kether, so too does it mean the dawning of Ayin, Ayin Sof, and Ayin Sof Or. And just as three stands for the three combined elements of salt, sulfur, and mercury to the alchemists, so too does it connote the trinity of Catholic Christianity and the blue degrees of Freemasonry. Whenever we see the ashlar cube representing earth, we must think of the three other elemental worlds and realize that the perfection of this ashlar cube symbol of the aligned chakras and cleansed aura of a good soul is only the first step, that of making good karma in the real world to achieving transcendence from it. But know that now we have taken that step together, and it is the hardest step because it is the first. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of first-degree contributors.